Okay. Hello, my name is Sam Feltham, and welcome to Expert Interviews on Smash the Fat. Uh, with me today is nutritionist and author Christine Cronow. Is that how you say it, Christine Cronow? Yep. yep, that's great. Perfect. How are you doing? Yeah, fantastic. Cool, because you're coming all the way from Brisbane, um, and uh, how's how's the weather there today? Actually, it's a bit cloudy. We just had a storm, so it's nice and cool and fresh, so it's lovely. <laughs> no way, because uh, yeah, actually, here in London, it's very sunny. Oh, it surprisingly. Is <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. Brilliant, brilliant. Uh, anyway, so you are the author of The Fat Revolution. Why is it the um, revolution of dietary fat in, um, in, at the moment? You just blanked out there, so I'll just answer what I heard. <laughs> so basically, you know, we've been following these low-fat guidelines for quite a long time now, and the low fat craze was supposed to make us lose weight and also improve our health, but it's really done the opposite. And we're in a situation where we're getting fatter than ever, even though we've reduced our calories, we've reduced our fat, and our health is in dire straits. So there's a real problem. Yeah, absolutely. And it seems as though the the exact opposite advice from a lot of government guidelines seems to be working for people. So, so why is that? Well, basically, if you look at the guidelines that they give us, pretty much every single one causes the very disease that they're trying to prevent. So, for example, they tell us to lower our fat intake, but lowering our fat intake actually makes us fatter, and it also increases risk for heart disease for a number of reasons. So every single one of them, you know, they tell us to swap saturated fats for polyunsaturated fats. Those new fats, those polyunsaturated fats, also increase risk for heart disease. Um, we lower our fat rates, so we start eating all these low-fat products, but they're loaded with sugar. And sugar has been shown to increase risk for obesity and for heart disease. So, you know, if you go through all the guidelines, pretty much all of them, do the opposite of what they're intended to do. <laughs> Which seems completely crazy, uh, but from, from my own experience um, and my experience of working with clients, um, this seems to be the case. Um, so firstly, how, how have the governments got it so wrong and why do they keep on giving this false advice? Well, basically, if you go back and look at, at the history of it, a lot of it has come from big business. So this false idea that fat and cholesterol are bad for us makes a lot of people a lot of money. So big business you know, is selling all these low-fat products, the, the oil industry, the seed oil industry, all those types of industries are making a load of money in addition to the pharmaceutical industry. So there's a lot of vested interest in keeping this myth going, even though it really should have died a long time ago. It's clear that it's not working, but we're still persisting. We're still doing it. Yeah, absolutely. And it's sort of uh, people like yourself um, and, and me too and lots of other people, Jimmy Moore, Zoe Harkham, lots of people out there that are really starting to, to sort of drop Pebbles in the pond and making some ripples go, and it looks like science really held up, um, especially with uh, what's happened in the past few weeks in Australia. Um, now, this is actually in the in the form of a question from uh, Diane Smith on the on the website there, but um, I'm very interested to know uh, what's gone on in the past few weeks well, in Australia. Well, really, it's. It's been a whirlwind because not only did we have the Catalyst program, which really smashed the idea that you know fat and cholesterol are bad for us, but we also had a lot of other things happen that week. Dr. Roz made a statement that was astounding when he was interviewing somebody about um, Alzheimer's, and he made a statement that he basically acknowledged the cholesterol myth. You know, and he's come from a very long history 
of being very conservative about that. So, you know, there's been a lot of change. But after the cholesterol, after the Catalyst program aired, we've had a lot of uproar here. We've had uh, a lot of interest in the media. And just today, we had news articles come out again to say that, um, you know, doctors are very, dis you know, actually I think one of them said that, you know, he was quite disturbed at the fact that people are stopping their cholesterol medication because they've had a survey done by a drug company and they basically said that all the people who have been concerned after this took place, after the Catalyst program, 40% of those have just stopped cold turkey and the other 60% are wanting to stop after talking to their doctor and I don't know if that, you know, data is, is correct or not but certainly there's been a lot of impact after that Catalyst program. Absolutely and there's been a lot of um a bit of backlash against sort of the Heart Foundation. I know that the the fa their Facebook page was inundated with messages, weren't they? It it absolutely was inundated, and the big message coming from the public is please relook at the guidelines. You know, have a look at the evidence again, uh, and you know, let us know what's actually healthy for us because you know at the moment. People are feeling like they can't rely on health guidelines. Absolutely, and um, it really sort of saddens me when um, you know you've got a program like that that did such a great job of um, proper investigative journalism there, um, and finding out straight from the top leading experts in the field. Yeah, you know, despite them saying all of that. Um, you know, the Heart Foundation won't change their guidelines or anything like that. Is, it, is there mass cognitive dissonance there, Christine, or am I just barking up the wrong tree? Well, basically, that's exactly right. I was extremely impressed with the program. I thought that they did a great job from a scientific perspective. Um, obviously, they've been criticising the media for not doing that, but I think they did a very good job. I really don't think that the other side had too much to say, even though they were given less airtime. You could see them answering questions, and really, they didn't have too much more to say. You know, they were kind of stumped when when she was asking them the questions. You know, when when she was telling them what her other experts were saying. So, you know, to me, they've done a great job, and I think it's in the best interest of all conventional health professionals to actually take notice of it and decide, you know, how are they going to, you know, what are they going to do from this point on? Are they going to going to consider it or are they going to stay on the ship and go down with the ship? Because I, I think that it will eventually go down. It's just a matter of time. Yeah, absolutely, because the, um, the evidence is really starting to build up now and um, one of the things that you mentioned to me before we started the interview was that um, ABC Catalyst asked the Heart Foundation for their evidence and they only supplied one research paper, is that correct? Exactly, so Dr. De Macy asked for their evidence to support what they were saying and they supplied one study and that one study didn't even say that saturated fat is correlated in any way to heart disease. So, you know, they keep saying over and over again there's an abundance of evidence. We have decades of evidence, you know, this is, you know, general conventional health professionals who say this. But where is that evidence? We keep asking for it. It's never presented. We're just told that it's there. But being, you know, being told that it's there isn't good enough. We need to see it. What are they basing these assumptions on? Yeah, it, it seems absolutely bizarre and, um, you know, they, they had the opportunity there, a large program like Catalyst, to, yeah. to present their evidence and they had one paper, it seems crazy. I mean, as you say, it wasn't even um, a, 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 that much of a supportive paper anyway. Um, but um, with all of that, yeah, and but with all of that aside, um, why specifically and scientifically is is fat not making us fat or sick? Well basically we just you know vilified the wrong food 
you know, so basically if we go back in history uh, when we weren't fat, so even back to the 1800s, early 1800s, we ate around four teaspoons of sugar a day and that was really mostly the wealthy people anyway. So between 1890 and 1920, sugar consumption doubled and that's because we saw, you know, the very first confectionery companies. Now we've just been increasing sugar consumption ever since then. So basically 1926 was when we had the very first documented case of, heart, uh, of a heart attack. And by the 1950s, they were becoming extremely common. So experts were scrambling for a solution, but unfortunately they picked the wrong one. Ansel Keys had his theory about saturated fat, and you know, he didn't have good evidence for that theory, but through a number of unfortunate events, that theory became accepted consensus. And now, you know, saturated fat is just considered, you know, artery clogging and, and you know, all of this stuff that it actually doesn't do. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and uh, why, why doesn't fat make us fat as well? I might need you to repeat that Sorry. one. <laughs> Sorry, Christine, the line seems to be a bit bad over exactly. over the over the Pacific Ocean, the Indian Ocean, over yeah, everything. Okay. Um, <laughs> but uh, but why? On top of all of that, why why doesn't fat make us fat? Because that's such a common question that I get from. Uh, from people that, that come to me that want help and you know I'm wearing my my fat is fantastic t-shirt here like so yeah there we go perfect um, yeah, which is great and I, I wear that a lot I even wore it to an obesity conference last week which was rather hilarious uh, but, <laughs> yeah. but why is it that uh, that fat doesn't make us fat well it's a huge misconception and basically different calories behave differently in our body. That's why calorie counting is pretty much meaningless because we all know fat has more calories than just about anything else. But it doesn't behave the same way in the body. So basically when we eat carbohydrates we can only store or use a very small amount at any one time. We can only store around 500 grams of glycogen at any one time. So if we eat more than that generally we have to store that as fat. It's just basic biochemistry. Now fats, now before, before I go into it I'll just explain that different fats do act differently in the bodies and when I say fat I'm generally talking about saturated fats. So saturated fats are full of short chained and medium chained fatty acids and they act differently than long chain fatty acids in the body. So basically these short and medium chain fatty acids go pretty much straight to the liver and they're used for instant energy. So this is why they're not generally stored in the adipose tissue, in our fatty tissue. Perfect. Um, so for instance if um, I eat eggs and bacon for breakfast cooked in, in butter, um, is, is, is that Gonna gonna make me fat and sick, or is my cereal with skimmed milk gonna make me sick? And and why would one do the other? Oh, exactly. I mean, bacon. If you can get a quality bacon that's organic and, mm -hmm. and you mm -hmm. know pasture fed, then that's perfect. Bacon and eggs for breakfast with loads of butter on it. You know, it's often portrayed as a heart attack on a plate, but it's the opposite. It will give you loads of energy for the day. It won't make you fat, and it'll make you feel good. Absolutely, and then, and then what is it that uh, the you know any common cereal like a um, like a bran filled cereal along with skimmed milk? Why why is that not a great choice for people? Well, it's basically pure carbohydrate. You're starting your day on pure carbohydrate, and remember what I said before about the glycogen. So if you're eating pure carbohydrate in the morning, you're going to be storing fat. And it's interesting, I went to a gym one time and I saw they were having some sort of celebration and out on the table they had an array of, you know, things for people to eat. 
and every single one of those things on the table would have been prompting people's body to store fat. So you know the the margarine, the uh, the toast, the orange juice. You know all of it was considered healthy, but every single one of those items would prompt your body to store fat if you had too much of it. Yeah, it's um it's really crazy and um what what really gets me. Um, and this this is a little bit controversial, but uh, when you've got things like um, charities like Cancer Research UK, for instance, and they're doing like a big event like that, but then they have sweets and candies and things like that, and you know you're thinking that's precisely what's causing the cancer that's you know making you to do the research. You know you should probably be handed out some coconut oil or. <laughs> Along those lines. I know it's astounding, and you see that everywhere. You know, you see diabetic conferences with donuts on the table. You see, mm. um, you know, raising money for breast cancer research with little donuts or little pastries, you know, with pink icing. It's just incredible that people have not recognised the fact that sugar increases risk, or excess sugar increases risk for cancers diabetes, all those other modern diseases, and they're called modern diseases for a reason. We didn't used to have them. Yeah, it seems absolutely bizarre to me, but um, again, hopefully, we're going to contribute to uh, to improving the world on, on, that, on that level. Um, anyway, um, so um, as I was mentioning to you before we started the interview, you've got, you've had the most amount of questions we've ever had for an interviewee. Um, so we're only going to be able to get through ten, unfortunately, <laughs> before our time is up. Um, so I want to start off with um, Anne Christian Sandland from Sweden. Uh, she asked on Facebook, uh, "What is her best argument?" when she meets the fat phobics? Oh, <laughs> well, <laughs> my best argument is probably they can see me talking. <laughs> and they, when, they watch <laughs> me eating, when they watch me eating, that's when it really hits home for people, when they see me sit down at breakfast time and I have my three eggs and you know maybe fatty lamb chops or something like that. I put butter on top of my food once I've cooked it in butter. So you know that's when it really hits home because people see what I look like. They want to know what I'm doing, and then when they see it, you know it's a bit hard for them <laughs> to believe it. But there it is. It's crazy, isn't it? I mean, it's, it's sort of similar for me as well because I, I'm a, a very lean guy um, and uh, yeah as I mentioned before I, I eat eggs and bacon for breakfast uh, pretty much every morning um, and uh, you know, it's like how do you slim well, it's actually a slimming this keeps you slim this type of yeah. diet um, which, is, which is quite funny um, and, and quickly what does your daily diet look like Christine? Can you just repeat that one sorry? And what does your daily diet look like? Oh, my daily diet. Well, basically, that was my breakfast. Uh, for lunch, I'll probably have, you know, some more protein. Um, actually, I have a denatured whey protein uh, powder as well that I'd like to have as a snack. Uh, but basically, I'll have more protein and fat for lunch, so maybe a chicken thigh. Definitely has to have the skin on, you know, all that sort of lovely stuff. Uh, maybe with a salad or a few vegetables. And then I generally have a light dinner, so I don't have as much protein and fat for my dinner time. You know, maybe a vegetable curry or something like that, but I put loads of butter in the curry. Awesome, awesome. That sounds lovely. <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll, I'll try one. I love my uh, fruit salad and whipped cream, things like <laughs> little treats like yeah. that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I uh, I usually do frozen berries with uh, with single cream on top. It's pretty good because it sort of freezes the cream there, and if if you match it up, it's almost like it's like a berry ice cream, um, which is which is a great one, really good one. Um, okay. Next question, um, Ainsley Johnston from your neck of the woods in Brisbane 
us on Facebook. I would love to know your opinion on intermittent fasting. Right. Well, this is a good question, and there's a lot of you know information about it. But basically, intermittent fasting does have health benefits, but it only has those health benefits if it's done correctly and if you're already in a fat adapted state, so you're burning fat for energy. If you're not burning fat for energy, then you're just restricting calories if you're doing if you're fasting. So basically what happens then is if you do a period of fasting, you're actually uh, you know, using ketones for energy, you're burning fat from your own body. So you're not going hungry per se, you're actually using energy from your own body. Now there is some you know, information that it might be more difficult for women to do intermittent fasting because you know, they may have you know, issues with you know, um, adrenals and, and things like that because their hormones are based on you know, fat and things like that in their diet. So you can actually do things slightly differently you know, if, it, if it doesn't feel good for you. For example, just skipping a meal skipping dinner at night is a great way to give your digestion system a huge break and you know do a little bit of fasting and the other thing you can do is if you want to do a little bit of a longer fast you can actually take coconut oil or have a cup of tea with coconut oil and butter in it so you're getting that fat which keeps you in that ketogenic state you know burning fat for energy without you know getting sluggish and things like that if, if that's what happens to you when you're not eating. Great advice, great advice. Uh, uh, next question uh, is from Trish in Melbourne. Um, is the low carb, high fat diet safe for someone with fatty liver? Well this is a great question and it's one that I get, it's extremely common because generally when you go to the doctor with fatty liver they'll tell you to go on a low fat diet because they think that it's fat that's causing fatty liver but it's actually the opposite, it's the high carbohydrate diet that's causing the fatty liver so low carb high fat is perfect nutrition for a fatty liver Perfect, perfect. Uh, then Chris Nuggle uh, from New South Wales Ask what stevia brand do you recommend that you use in your cooking? Well, my favourite brand is Nirvana, and you know there's a little bit of you know funny stuff going on about stevia. People often say, oh, it tastes bitter and all that sort of stuff. Now, it is true that cheaper brands there is a bitter component in the leaf in the stevia leaf, but in the better brands, that bitter component is removed and it is removed in that Nirvana brand. So if you get the 100% pure extract powder, that bitter component has been removed. But there is another thing with the stevia I find. I think that people have heard that it tastes bitter, so they have it in their head. So if they know something's been sweetened with stevia, they often have a reaction and say, oh, that's not made with stevia, is it? But oftentimes, if they don't know that stevia is in there, they love it. They think it's fantastic. So there's a little bit of, you know, preconceived ideas, in my opinion, when it comes to stevia. Absolutely. And then, do you uh, do you put an upper limit on the amount of stevia that you'd put in your your weekly diet, or um, do you think it's not a problem? Well, I don't think you know. I don't think you generally want to use a lot of it, you know, because what happens is when you're uh, when you're in this state, and I've actually been in a fat burning state for 13 years now, so I haven't eaten sugar in that time. And basically, when you're healthy, uh, you don't actually crave the sweets like you did, you know, when you were eating sugar and carbohydrates. You don't have that yearning for it. So basically, you you still enjoy sweets, you know, and I enjoy them here and there, but you don't tend to want them all the time, so I don't really have to think about limits or anything like that. But stevia is such, you know, it's it's used in such tiny amounts because it's so strong, mm -hmm. and it's a completely natural herb. So, you know, for me, it's it's one of the best sweeteners you can use. It, it doesn't act like a sugar in the body. It's got no fructose, so I think it's fantastic. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, next question from Kutara Eve. Uh, she asks, 
would you make any specific hyper recommendations for pregnant or breastfeeding women? And what are your thoughts on ketosis during these times as well? Well, this is a great question, and it's another common question that I get. But basically, uh, it's actually our modern diet that's really inappropriate for breast pregnant and breastfeeding women. And in fact, there are vitamins now that we pretty much have eliminated from our diet. Like, for example, vitamin K2, it's absolutely essential, but it, it comes in grass-fed butter and, and you know things like Gouda cheese, soft cheese, and all of those things we've been told are villains in our diet, so we've pretty much eliminated them. So pretty much nobody gets vitamin K2 anymore. So a low-carb, high-fat diet is a perfect diet for both pregnant and breastfeeding women. Also, lots of egg yolks are fantastic. Uh, a nice quality fish oil is fantastic. And also, if you make bone broths, that's also a lovely thing to do for pregnant and breastfeeding women, just to get you know some more nutrition and some extra calcium and things like that. Absolutely, and um, cholesterol itself is so essential to to a baby's development, especially their brain development. And, you know, when we do have people that are on statins and um, on cholesterol-lowering diet, it's a recipe for it? Exactly. And the thing is that our children are just not getting the nutrition they need. And, you know, a lot of people focus on, oh, my child won't eat vegetables. Well, actually, the most important thing you can get into them as they're developing is fat and cholesterol. You know, mm -hmm. we've forgotten that they need egg yolks, they need butter, that those are all brain foods, those are all development foods. We need to give our children those foods. And, you know, fat and cholesterol is extremely nutrient dense. So they need protein and they need that fat and cholesterol. And the other question about, you know, is it dangerous to be in a ketogenic state when you're pregnant? Absolutely not, because if you look at our ancestry, they would have been in a ketogenic state all the time. It's actually a myth that this state is dangerous for us because they just weren't able to access that many carbohydrates. They couldn't. So, you know, they would have been in that fat-burning state, and it's only because we're eating too much sugar that we've come out of that fat-burning state and into a sugar-burning state, but it's really... Our body's trying to get rid of the sugar because it's a dangerous situation for it to be in. But the sugar keeps coming in, so we keep burning sugar. That's the only reason we do it. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, then we have Tim Kempton uh, who asks, where can we get our bloods analysed that give us numbers that actually mean something? We all agree cholesterol doesn't mean anything. Um, so who does uh, fraction LDL, etc, etc? Well, basically, this is a question that I could talk for the next hour on, but, you know, to <laughs> summarise, <laughs> uh, it's different in every country. Obviously, it's great if you can, you know, you can get those tests that evaluate how small your LDL particles are and things like that. Uh, they're not available everywhere. There's another test, APOB, which also helps you know get a picture of what's happening with those LDL particles. But there's there's a whole heap of other issues as well. For example, if we're on a low carb, high fat diet, our triglycerides almost always drop. And what happens then is that the calculation that's used to calculate the LDL because it's not tested directly, generally, is incorrect. It doesn't work for low triglycerides. And that's something that not even the pathologists know about. They know it doesn't work when triglycerides are high, but they don't know it doesn't work when triglycerides are low. So you have someone going on a low-carb, high-fat diet, and they think, wow, this is great. All of a sudden, they go in for a test. Their LDL looks like it's through the roof. It's not actually because the calculation isn't working. Their doctor says, what are you doing? And then mm. they start being concerned. You know, not that I'd be concerned anyway if if my LDL was high anyway, but there's so many aspects to it. But really the main thing is make sure you get an LDL test if you're going to get a cholesterol test. And the other thing is 
really you want to look at those triglycerides most of the time. That's a really good indication if you've got low triglycerides, that's a good indication of heart health. Much better indication than total cholesterol, unless it's too low. We don't want cholesterol that's too low either. Absolutely, and uh, this is this is something that I've recently experienced uh, with my experiments. Um, my uh, triglycerides were particularly low at the beginning of this 5,000 calorie experiment. My HDL was a was a good high level, um, and then after 21 days of eating what could be um, said to be a heart healthy. Um, type diet because I was having all bran for breakfast, I was having whole wheat sandwiches for lunch, my triglycerides quadrupled, <laughs> unbelievable, um, and my um, HDL went down by a third, uh, which was real scary, um, that really scared me, um, and um, then in my rehab diet after that, uh, I managed to half my triglycerides, so they're going back down, they're not back quite to normal um, and my HDL went up back again um, so that sort of relieved me a little bit um, but I'm, I'm, I'm thinking it's going to take quite a bit longer than just three weeks to repair the damage that I did in those 21 days. Yes and imagine people who are on those diets constantly I mean it, it's just mind-boggling but really that's where the damage is being done it's the high carbohydrate high sugar diet that's causing the heart disease. So once people are on low-carb, high-fat diets, I personally don't see the need to have a cholesterol test because, you mm. know, you're doing everything you can to, to do the best for your heart health. Absolutely, absolutely. Then we've just got a couple of questions left. Uh, first one is from Gary Theodore from Sydney uh, who asks, what a good food choice for a heavy training session and after the weight training session? Well, protein and fat. <laughs> That's yeah. my fact. So, you know, having that beautiful breakfast with lots of eggs, lots of fat, you know, um, fat is such a good, you know, pre-training thing to eat. It's long sustaining energy. You won't run out of fuel, basically. And then afterwards, protein again is fantastic for building that muscle. You know, once you've, you know, done your workout, protein is, is another, you know, great choice. So protein and fat all the way. Absolutely. Um, for instance, yesterday, um, I, did, I go to a CrossFit gym near me. Um, and my, my pre-workout is a couple of tablespoons of coconut oil, um, which helps me. Me about and after um, I had a, a, a good solid pork roast afterwards, which was which is absolutely lovely, uh, along with crackling as well, which was yeah. dead nice. Um, so it's a good post post workout meal that was. Yeah. Um, and then for, go on, go on, Christine. That's perfect. I was just going to say. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Um, and then we do our last question for today uh, from Louise Bloxham from Bristol in the UK. Um, she asks, if you eat natural foods, do you have to limit calories or just be guided by your appetite? Well, this is another great thing about fats is that they actually produce our form of hormones. So CCK, if you want to look it up, is one of our fullness hormones and that is you know stimulated by eating fat so like you were mentioning before if you have a juicy pork roast you know pork chop with the crackling and that big thick piece of you know fat under the crackling eat the whole thing and <laughs> if you had plans for dessert you'll quickly change your mind you'll quickly see that you won't be able to eat anymore you'll be full so that's what fat does for us. You don't have to think about how much you're eating. You know, I haven't eat, I haven't thought about how much I'm eating in over 12 years, and it's so freeing because, you know, you just eat when you feel like eating, and you eat as much as you feel like eating. You don't have to think about it. You don't have to worry about it, and your weight just stays the same. 
Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and, and the way that I like to put it is that these foods biochemically balance us, in essence. Yeah. You know, um, the, the, the fake foods that, you know, uh, tend to be pushed by a lot of government guidelines um, tend to put us into a biochemical imbalance. It throws our hormones and enzymes all over the place. Uh, yeah. But these real foods, and particularly the uh, the high fat foods, biochemically balance us because, as you were saying before, there, these are the foods that make us um, that make our hormones and enzymes and just make our body work the way that it's meant to be. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, hopefully um, this will go towards towards that message. I think as well. Yes, absolutely. I think you know. You know, demonising fats was the worst thing that we possibly could have done for our health. So not only are we able to, you know, enjoy those fats because, you know, let's face it, most people really miss the fats when they don't have them and they're absolutely ecstatic when they find out, well, I can have my butter, I can have my bacon and I don't have to feel guilty about it. But it's also such a boost for health, you know. Especially women are walking around, they're fatigued, their hormones aren't working properly. All of this is because they're not getting the right fuel into their body. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and, but um, you're here to help Christine and thank you so much for your time today. Where can people find out more information about you and, and get some of the great advice that you give? Well, basically, if you just search The Fat Revolution, you'll find my website, but it's christinecroner.com, C-R-O-N-A-U.com. And also, I post something interesting every single day on Facebook, so that's a fantastic place to go because, you know, the information's free and, you know, it's just a little boost every day, some fascinating information about low-carb, high-fat or what's going on in, in the world of, you know, this revolution. So... And there's also a lot of people to talk to on there about, you know, their stories. People post all the time amazing stories, you know, about, you know, their blood results changing or, you know, change in their health or, or fantastic weight loss, all kinds of improved conditions. Fantastic, fantastic. Um, and uh, if you are watching this on YouTube or on the website, all of Christine's links are below where you can go to her website, Facebook page and even follow her on Twitter. Um, again, thank you so much for your time to be really appreciate it and uh, hope to get you back on the show next year possibly. You're very welcome Sam, it's my pleasure. Awesome, awesome. Well thanks again Christine and for everyone else, be well and of course, smash it out.